Okay, so before we get into our research hypotheses, there's a couple of methodological checks that we need to do first. And this is quite common for an experimental setup, just to make sure that there's no potential problems with the design or the measurement of things in your study. So the first one here is that we want to check to see if there are any differences in the proportion of high versus low somatic symptom burden individuals across our two experimental groups. So making sure that that say everybody in the mindfulness group doesn't happen to also have a very low somatic symptom burden, whereas everybody in the control group doesn't happen to have a very high somatic symptom burden. And the reason that we need to do this is because even though mindfulness, our mindfulness variable was randomly allocated, to, so participants were randomly allocated to either being in the mindfulness group or the control group, we want to make sure that even though it's very unlikely that there don't just happen to be different clusters of people across our two different groups. So the benefit of random allocation to conditions is that random allocation should get rid of any differences between the groups that say there should be an even spread of high versus low somatic symptom burden individuals across our two experimental groups. But it's always good to check that just to make sure that just by random chance, we just didn't happen to get differences between the groups, um, which could potentially confound our results. So to give you an example here, if our groups did differ on somatic symptom burden, and we found that there were, say, some differences in negative affect according to mindfulness, our mindfulness independent variable, then those differences could be explained by the fact that they differ on somatic symptom burden and not actually be due to the effect of mindfulness itself. So we just need to have this kind of methodological check to make sure that our groups are even in terms of the breakdown of high versus low somatic symptom burden people across our two groups. And the second methodological check that we're going to make is to make sure that our sample isn't any different in terms of their natural tendency towards mindfulness, their nat natural disposition towards mindfulness. They're no different to what's been found in previous research. So if we're looking at a sample of Macquarie University psychology students, we want to make sure that they're not more or less mindful, naturally mindful, than other kinds of populations. And we can use standard norms on this dispositional mindfulness measure to compare our sample to what other um, previous research has found. And this is actually a particularly important step to do for something that can be quite trendy, like mindfulness is currently a bit trendy. So something, any kind of construct or any kind of therapy or intervention or practice that can be in the in the public consciousness so something that's just quite common in terms of publicly known at any particular time so it could be that at the moment because mindfulness is a relatively common thing for people to know about and possibly to practice themselves things like mindfulness meditation it could be that say young people today our, our young people that we're um, drawing from to get our sample for our study it could be that they're more knowledgeable knowledgeable about it then past, then say 10, 20 years ago, and they could be more likely to practice it themselves. And if we have differences between the population from which our sample was drawn and other populations, it might mean that our results might not be generalizable to wider populations. If it's something that's different, say now in 2017 compared to 20 years ago, it could be that there are cultural differences or social differences that might limit the generalizability of our findings. So again, it's just a methodological check to make sure that, our, the, that the population from which our sample was drawn is similar enough to what other populations have been used in research for our results to be generalizable. Okay, so we've got those two methodological checks and then we've got our more formal research hypotheses. So we'll do our methodological checks first and then we'll investigate our research hypotheses. So we've got four of the different research hypotheses. The first one is that there's going to be a relationship between people's expectation of pain and their experience of pain. So in particular, individuals' expectation of the pain tolerance induction task measured by their expected negative affect will be positively associated with their experience of the pain tolerance induction task, which is measured by actual negative affect or experienced negative affect. That's our first hypothesis. 
Our second hypothesis is that individuals' expectation of the pain tolerance induction task, their expected negative affect, will actually be worse than their experience of the negative affect. So their expectations will be worse than their actual experience. Our third hypothesis is that individuals with a high somatic symptom burden will have a more negative expectation of the pain task compared to those with low somatic symptom burden. And finally, that people who got the mindfulness instructions, the group that received the mindfulness audio instructions, they will get a less negative or experience a less negative, um, negative affect experience of the task compared to the people who got the control instructions. So this hypothesis is saying that we think that the induction of mindfulness will result in people having a less negative experience, will result in them experiencing less negative affect compared to the people who got the control instructions. So those are our four hypotheses. The study procedure itself, um, I'll just outline with the next slide here. So at the start, people addressed a questionnaire. They answered a particular questionnaire where they answered some questions, including dispositional mindfulness, their somatic symptom burden, and their negative affect um, expectation of the task. So negative affect one is their expectations of negative affect. They were then randomly allocated to either a mindfulness or a control group. And this was the audio that they listened to, the individual 10 minute long audio, either a mindfulness audio or the control mind wandering audio. They then did the cold presser task. So they actually put their hand in the cold water for as long as they could possibly stand. And then they rated their negative affect again. And this was their actual experience of negative affect, how uncomfortable they felt the task, how anxious they were about the task, how displeased they were at having completed the task, that kind of thing. So kind of four steps in terms of this experiment. And in terms of understanding our data, the data that was collected from the experiment, the first step that we always need to engage in is understanding descriptive statistics. So summarizing the data that's been collected in order to understand our sample and in order to understand whether our sample are representative of our population and understand the distributions of variables in our sample. So the first table on the left hand side is a frequency table of our experimental group variable. And what you can see here is that we've got 50 individuals in each of our groups. We've got 50 people in the mind wandering control condition and 50 people in the mindfulness condition. And this is perfectly 50 50 because individuals were randomly allocated to one of these two groups. So we ensure that there was an even split of people between the two conditions. The next frequency table is a table of somatic symptom burden. And you can see that, as I said before, we've got two categories for somatic symptom burden, low, mild versus moderate, severe. And you can see the majority of our individuals fall into the low, mild category. So 75 of the 100 fall into the low, mild category and 25 of the 100 fall into the moderate, severe category. The next thing we'll look at is our distributions of negative affect. So on the left hand side here, we've got negative affect one, which is their expected negative affect. That was the one that they answered right at the start of the experiment about how much negative affect they expected to experience. And you can see what we've got here is a nice normal looking distribution. We've got a peak of scores around five or so in the middle, but people's scores range from just above zero to all the way up to 10. Similarly for negative affect two, so this was their actual experience of negative affect after the task, they reported on how much negative affect they actually experienced once the task was over. And you can see again here, we've got a normal-ish distribution, a normal-ish bell curve. Again, scores peak around four to six in the middle there, and they range from zero to 10. And we can get our table of descriptive statistics for our new two numeric variables here using the summarize command down the bottom. So negative affect one, negative affect two, you can see that they've got really similar mean scores got our standard deviation, which is a measure of variability, and they both range from just above zero to up to 10. The next thing we'll get to summarize is our dispositional mindfulness variable. So DM total dispositional mindfulness. And again, you can see that that's a numeric variable. It's a nice normal-ish distribution. It peaks around just above 120 in the middle there. Oops, sorry. Um, and our summary table of numeric descriptive statistics down the bottom there as well. So the mean score is about 125, standard deviation is 16, and scores range from, 18, uh, from 84 to 167. 
So those are our descriptive statistics. The next thing we want to do is to address those two methodological questions that we've got 